Jonathan Sabah, co-founder and CEO of Journey Clinical. Thank you so much for being here with the Dales Report. Thank you for having me, Nicole. It's a pleasure to be here. So a uh, telehealth platform that empowers independent psychotherapists to offer psychedelic therapies in their own practice. This is what you do. And are you the only one doing it? To my knowledge, we are. Yeah, we're the first who came up with this model. Um, I mean, you know, it's, it's early days, so maybe there'll be others. But um, for now... <laughs> and the Journey Clinical us. model, tell me a little bit about it. It allows patients to essentially work with their existing therapists rather than being referred out. Right. So essentially what we looked to do at Journey Clinical was support mainstream adoption of psychedelic therapies. And what we found was that supporting independent practices or small, small even medium practices and independent practitioners to incorporate these treatments as an adjunct to therapy was just a better path. Uh, it also, instead of having them refer out, it also protects the therapeutic alliance between them and their patients. So we found it's a better way to administer it. And when we looked at what were the barriers to entry to offering these treatments, what we found was access to a medical team or a prescribing physician really is the main issue. And so that's what we built. We built a telehealth platform that allows them to do that. And what we do is take on all of the medical aspect of psychedelic assisted psychotherapy. The way it works is that they refer a patient back to us. We take on eligibility, prescriptions, and outcome monitoring. The patient gets a bit of ketamine at home. They then do a CAP session either in person or remotely with their therapist. They come back, and we see them at a minimum four times a year. So we're not a ketamine dispensary, but we're actually a care management system. The other part of that is that we work with these psychotherapists to essentially support a collaborative care model. And that allows us basically to build bespoke treatment plans at scale because, well, and as you may know, you know, these, these things don't, you cannot take a cookie cutter approach to these treatments. You can't tell someone six treatments and you're cured. That's actually not what happens. So we're able to meet people where they're at and support, um, you know, better clinical outcomes in our view. Uh, and the other part so of, are oh, you, sorry. Are you part of Sorry, I just wanted to, to ask one thing quickly before it evades me. But So then are you part of the integration process? Great question. So we are essentially taking on the medical aspect. So we serve as the doctor in this notion, right? We're basically their in-house doctor. So the th psychotherapists give the preparation, sit with the patient when the patient self-doses, and offer the integration work. What we take on is we take on all the medical aspect of this work. So we all work with the, the psychotherapist to meet, to make sure that the patient is eligible, that the treatment plan makes sense, to support a variety of modalities depending on what the, the psychotherapist is looking to offer. So we're, we're operating as the, do, the in-house doctor, if you like. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. How did this idea come to you? Obviously, you saw a gap in, in, the, in the market. Um, how, how did this come to you as the idea of the thing to fill it? Well, there's multiple reasons how this came to me. First, of course, me studying to be a clinician was, uh, uh you know, a lens that I, that I have, where I thought that clinicians were a good, um, uh, way to distribute these treatments or to, to deliver them. Uh, the other part was again, as I was saying, mainstream adoption and really what's the direct path and essentially while centralized clinics do a good job at administering these treatments, it's hard to think of mass adoption because they're not embedded in local communities and they don't have a direct relationship with the, these populations like psychotherapists do. And so, you know, people rather stay with their therapist than be referred out. And so, right. you know, what we think this should look like is basically, you know, EMDR, CBT, psychedelics, these are the tools uh, that are available when appropriate, they're not always appropriate, for their patients to help their treatments. So it's a holistic view to care that we took, and we thought that psychedelics should be part of that. And so what we are doing essentially is is a delivery mechanism, right? Right, right. And are people taking to ketamine therapy as quickly as you had hoped? I mean, at least in our experience, we've got a pretty big wait list of patients. We have a big wait list of psychotherapists, so we're expanding uh, in multiple states. And, you know, I think there's more demand than we can uh, we can cater to, actually. Is, is telehealth, telehealth is something I'm really interested in. I think expedited 
at least the interest of it by the the global pandemic and it being a necessity. Um, is it is it where you want it to be? Is telehealth where you believe? It, like, is it at its pinnacle right now in its efficacy? You mean for the treatments? Yeah, absolutely. Is this the best that it could be right now? I think that our model supports a high standard of care, to be honest, because the fact that we're keeping the this tripartite relationship between the patient, the psychotherapist, and the medical professional, it's a lot of it's a it's a good standard of care. Mm-hmm. The mode or the modality of doing it on a Zoom call or in person. I mean, we support both to be clear. Our telehealth yeah. part is the intake session and the psycho and the, the medical session uh, the consultations. But some psychotherapists do it in person, some do it remotely. Because of the safety of ketamine and because of the type of uh, delivery that we're doing, which is sublingual ketamine and relatively low dose sublingual ketamine and the low bioavailability of sublingual ketamine, this is a pretty safe modality. We're not looking here at an intravenous or high dose IM session where you, you need to have someone present. And so in that context, there is, you know, as long as we are making sure that the set and setting for the patient is well put together and safe and, you know, we've got a whole protocol for that, uh, it is actually very effective. Even, even people doing it at home, you know, don't need to get up and go home uh, after a session, which can be complicated. They can do it and mm-hmm. they, they can stay. They are, you know, psycho telehealth or psychotherapy Zoom sessions have exploded during the pandemic. And what we felt was, you know, potentially dangerous or problematic uh, in the past has proven not to be, right? There hasn't been a huge um, epidemic of people abusing drugs. There hasn't been, yeah. people have been actually successfully conducting psychotherapy. And this is the world we live in and it's not going away. It has changed our way of living. It has pushed us or even I would say, uh, you know, propulsed us into a new era without any like, you know, <laughs> whether we, like, whether it we or not. like it or not. Right. And it turns out that we're capable of a lot that the technologies that we have available are amazing and that the therapeutic alliance and the container between patients and therapists, if they're supported by responsible medical staff, uh, can administer these types of treatments safely and efficiently at home or in person. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So are you less stressed out than you used to be? Because I was reading up a little bit about your, your personal history and <laughs> businesses you've built and you know, meltdowns you've had, although not explicitly stated. <laughs> you know, uh, Journey Clinical, uh, you co-founded it with your, with your wife. Um, last time we had spoken, or, or sorry, ra- rather last time the Dales report, uh, reported on Journey Clinical, you know, you had just finished raising $3 million in seed funding. Um, and your work, you know, and then you went to school to become a clinical psychologist. So... <laughs> Where are you at? How are things? <laughs> How you doing? I'm, <laughs> I'm doing pretty good, actually. Um, you know, but I think I, I, I have an enjoyment for certain levels of stress and adrenaline that work in this context, just as, just a, baseline. Just as a baseline. But you know, I mean, I, I, to be, to be fair, I've not, I've, I've had to take a hiatus in school because running a early stage venture back startup, uh, and being in class is complicated. No shit. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, you know, I, I get to do what I love every day and I get to work on a topic that I find that I'm completely passionate about and obsessed about, you know, and mm. I, I get to work with amazing people who are passionate or equally, if not more passionate about the, the topic, I get to meet leaders in the industry and collaborate with them. And, and, you know, it's, it's pretty amazing. Like I, I, I shared this, um, in another, um, podcast and I, I, I and I, and I shared it on LinkedIn the other day and it was, you know, the, we, we sponsored Horizons Conference 
this mm, year. Nice. And when I started, you know, becoming, well, deciding to become a psychedelic therapist, I was in school and I didn't have a lot of money. And so I got a scholarship to go to Horizons. And I was, I remember, this was the last Horizons before this one. And I remember sitting in the room and saying, oh, this is so amazing. It's so cool. I really hope, you know, I, I remember fantasizing about speaking someday and things like that. And then I, I got to see this year, you know, or last year, uh, our logo projected on the Cooper Union, you know, you know, getting to meet like, you know, Rick Doblin, Leonard Picard, uh, you know, the it's amazing people who, who all the people from maps that all, all these organizations that I really admire, uh, you know, and also collaborating with, you know, we've got Igmar Gorman on our board, who's like, I was, you know, so, and, and I met him in school. So I got, to, I got to, mm. to, and Amanda Fielding too. I saw yeah, that she's on your board. Absolutely. Cool. Yeah. And, and so, you know, yeah. we, we just got to meet all these amazing people and I'm such a nerd and I think it's so amazing. So, you know, we work crazy hours every day and, you know, getting a chance to meet my heroes, to work with people that are equally passionate and to build something that we really think is going to help revolutionize healthcare and bring access to these treatments to the masses. Mm -hmm. uh, that really gets me up at night. That really helps me wake up crazy early in the morning and sleep a little bit and go back to it. And it's also a lot of fun. You know, I think we have a really mm -hmm. great time, um, you know, building a startup. Like I, I, it's really exciting to be in this position. And I think it's a very unique thing to experience. It's very psychedelic mm -hmm. to build a startup. Everything you, you are is going to come up. All your fears are going to come up mm -hmm. and you know, the, you're going to have to face them just because of the <laughs> dynamics you're involved in. It's everything comes right up in your face and you have to face it. You have to look at it. You have to consider it. And so that's, yeah, that's fun but intense. Mm. And then I get to do this with my wife who we live together. And so that's another aspect of that. And she's amazing also. Uh, but you know, so we decided not to take an office because for the sake of our marriage, <laughs> <laughs> that's a long winded answer to your question. No, that's great. I, I appreciate it. Um, speaking of fear, uh, you know, when people see the market start to slump, um, and they want to panic sell or they start to question whether the so-called psychedelic renaissance is truly upon us. What are your reactions or feelings to that as somebody who, you know, really is living this day to day or is it merely a market correction or, you know, is this really something to be concerned about? You know, I spent 20 years of my career working in finance, so I have a little bit of an, uh, of an understanding of financial markets and, you know, I worked in, in, in hedge funds mostly. And, and so I, I have a, this is not my first crisis. I actually started working in finance in March of 20, 20, 2000 and on the, or no, sorry, April of 2000. And my third week on the job was the bot, dot com bubble. So I, I got yeah, I to live through say. that and that was pretty intense. Yeah. Uh, and then the next yeah, one. And then, you know, 2008 and, <laughs> and then these things happen. I mean, so I don't think it's specific to psychedelics. Mm. I think that we, you know, there are market dynamics that created, um, you know, high prices on the, on the markets. It's hard to assess if we're entering a really big bear market, if there's a bubble that's popping or if, uh, it's a faster cycle so cycles has se seemed to be faster in the market than they used to be. Um, you know, we'll see, there's also a difference between private markets and public markets. But one thing that's for certain is that riskier assets get taken off the portfolio faster when people go from, uh, you know, aggressive to more aggressive uh, portfolio allocations to more defensive portfolio allocations. So if people are focused on growth, then they'll have more risk appetites. As soon as there's talk of in interest rate hikes, I think that they were talking about two hikes originally this year. It seems like it might be four. Uh, the rise in inflation caused some uh, concern to the Fed. And so that is probably driving 
that this, or not probably that is driving that decision decision making. Also, uncertainty in uh, Eastern Europe is creating uncertainty in the market. And so, you know, there are market corrections. Is it specific to psychedelics? I don't think so. I think that, you know, you can even, if you want a simple uh, comparison, you can look at crypto and crypto is suffering uh, very much as well. So, you know, it's yeah. it's standard that riskier assets get um, removed from, uh, you know, portfolios when there is more risk or less risk appetite in the market. Now, does that mean that this is not going, is going to stop the psychedelic renaissance? I, I seriously doubt that. I think that what is going on is that there's less speculation on the public markets that eventually might impact the private markets. We'll see. Uh, but there is a huge amount of dry powder and venture capital, and it like, it's likely going to be the biggest year in venture capital this year. You know, one of the biggest years, in, maybe the biggest year in history. Uh, and so, you know, the and the need for mental health reform and mental health solutions is still hasn't changed because the markets have changed. There's yeah. still hundreds of millions of people who need help and who are in dire need of this kind of help. So, you know, there are what these corrections tend to do is some companies. Uh, might have to restructure some don't survive but the overall ecosystem uh tends to survive and you can see like if you want a a a, a similar dynamic again crypto is, is is a is a place you can look at i think in 2019 there was a huge correction on bitcoin after it went to 19000 and then you know everybody thought crypto was over and that's it it's never going to happen and here we are and if you look at the dot com bubble it was exactly the same thing in 2000 you know everybody thought dot coms were the end that tech you know internet companies would never come up and you know Obviously, these are these are the blue chips of today. So it's hard to give a blanket statement on you know this is the end. There's anxiety in the market. There's anxiety in the market because there are market dynamics and risks get removed from portfolios, and then you know people risk appetites come back, and certain and good companies survive. Mm -hmm. So what's what's next then for Journey Clinical? Are we going to you know see you talking about the metaverse or what? <laughs> You know, I mean, that's a really interesting thing. I'm sure that at some point we'll have to think about that, but that's, um, I don't know. I don't understand it enough yet, but I, I, I'm suspecting that, you know, these things happen. So we'll see. I mean, it's, I, I don't know how you do VR and ketamine at the same time. So that seems complicated. It's not what I'd want to have, at least in my eyes while I'm tripping, but, <laughs> yeah. but okay. Well, on, on, on this planet, then. on this planet, I think that look, we're, we're now, uh, you know, actively building out our, our company. We've hired a lot of people. We are rolling out multiple states. We're growing our membership. So, you know, over the next couple of months, we're going to continue that progress. We're going to continue lecturing. We're going to, we're going to continue scaling uh, and, you know, to become a national service uh, and soon, we hope. And I think the other thing that are also like, one thing that we didn't mention is also that we're also a tech platform, right? And so in that context, you know, we've got a portal that's going to be rolled out soon for the member practitioners and, uh, you know, that is going to facilitate them to have all the resources they need online. Uh, yes. I think I saw that on your site as well, right? So you have two portals, one for uh, patients and one for practitioners. Right. Is that correct? Yeah. yeah. And we're, we're building all that out. So all th these are all things that are, uh, in progress and uh, hopefully it will be available soon excellent thank you very much sure. for your time <laughs>